Good evening. Good evening, um, Ella asked me to do this back. I was supposed to do it in May. Well, originally in March. Was it March first? <laughs> March and April. Uh, I got into this. I'm uh, a year ago. I didn't have any idea that, about any of this. And uh, oh, around the first year, I don't know when it was. Jimmy says to me, Jimmy Lovell. I've invited Jimmy Lovell, Carmen Bacha, Gigi Cicada, and Larry Spawn. And these are four guys that know as much about coal mining history in this area as anybody. And uh, I've learned a lot from these guys. But Larry, uh, Jimmy, in, uh, talked to me one day at a weird lunch and says, Dave, what do you know about the history of coal mining in this area? I says, well, my grandfather was a miner, and uh, my dad mined some, and my uncles mined. My grandfather had a dinky up in Daisy Hill. And so I wrote a little story about it, and uh, I got shanghaied, is what happened. <laughs> uh, he took that story, and he says, come talk to Alan Ro Roberts, and I come in there, and Alan says, here, you open May 1st. <laughs> I, don't, I had no idea. I, I can say that I have visited probably 75 museums in my life, all over the world. So I know what a museum looks like, <laughs> what it's supposed to look like. And, uh, but I didn't, I've never had any training in how to do this kind of stuff or what to do or how to research stuff. I've learned so much in this project. It's been really very, uh, it's great because I just retired five years ago and this has been a new vocation for me and I'm really enjoying it. I've enjoyed mainly, I've enjoyed all the information and the study and, the, and all, but I've enjoyed the people I've, uh, I've met. And Ella is one of my favorites. Aww. What a treasure. What a treasure she is, really. Uh, we're all very fortunate to have her. We are. Yes, we are. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I'll kind of get started here. Uh, I, 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 I'd like anybody to say anything, anytime you have any questions, anything, because it gets pretty, I'm boring. You know, I can, <laughs> you know, but if you have something that pops up that you'd like to know, you know, speak up. Now let's see if it worked there. This is my grandfather. One of the things I found out first when I started doing this was that this just wasn't a story. This was my story. I mean, I, you know, Weir is, is a place, I was born in California. But the reason I was born in California is all about Weir, Kansas. And, and uh, my dad and, uh, uh, you know, like I say, my uncles, they worked for my grandpa. This is John Hiram Wallace and his wife, Sarah Catherine Wallace, and she was a Wallace before she married him. But they weren't related. I've done all the, uh, all the ancestry on it, and they're, they're not related. But, uh, you know, his mind and what he did up there uh, is, is interesting, but I have some information on Sarah's family. They were a mining family as well. And one of the things I found out about her is my, she's my grandmother, my great my great-grandfather, her dad, was from Bone Hill, Scotland, and he's a Wallace, and he, and William Wallace was there, and one of the things I found interesting was that William Wallace was in 1200, uh, 12 something, you know, and he, you know, he fought the king, and he was executed, and everybody knows a little bit about William Wallace, but nobody knew much about it, and he was, he lived and died and probably would have been forgotten, except that a man wrote a book called Valiant Champion, Sir William Wallace, Knight of Ellerslie, and glorified all of his deeds in this book, and he became the famous Sir William Wallace. And uh, so in 1200, I, I've done some research, and I haven't been to Bone Hill, but I think I can find out a lot more about my ancestry if I go to Bone Hill, Scotland, because they have a huge genealogy uh, deal there. And uh, nobody, I don't think there's anybody that can actually say I'm a descendant of William Wallace's. But I think my family, the Wallace's on my, mom, on my grandmother's side, may have as good a claim to it as anybody alive. So, 
this is uh, Sarah's brother, and I lost, he's my great uncle. His name was William Merriam Wallace. He was killed at a mine out in uh, mine number 18. And, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, it, what, there were several interesting things about it. One was that they, the way they wrote about it in the newspapers. And they said things about his death that they would never say today. He was crushed to a pulp, they said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So they would never say that in the papers now. Yeah, but, but there's just something here in this funeral notice right here. You'll see this A-O-U-W. Anybody here know of the A-O-U-W? You guys know about the A-O-U-W? It's the Ancient Order of United Workmen. And the funeral was held under the auspices of the A-O-U-W. He paid a, a dues, and he was a member. And when he was killed in the mine, his wife was given $2,000, and they paid for the funeral. So that was, and this was before the unions. So this was, and, and uh, I'll tell you a little more about the AOUW. It's, it's pretty interesting. This is the newspaper articles where it says in one that he was uh, killed in the nine, uh, 14 shaft, but this one says 18, the Weir paper, and I think he was killed in the 18. Uh, I don't know why, because this is a Weir paper, I believe it. Not the Columbus paper. <laughs> Here's a, one of the symbols of the AOUW. This is the way they carved it on the headstones. Uh, I've been studying headstones lately. <laughs> this is their motto. Altrium alturus auxilio eget. And it says, each needs the help of the other. And I find in, in days past, organizations put forward more altruistic motives than you hear people speaking outwardly now. You know, it, 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 it was not just this. This was also the, the motto of uh, Delta Phi Chi, Phi Delta Chi, uh, one of the first fraternities in the colleges. And it's a pretty altruistic motto. And they joined together to help each other is what they did. And, and they sure helped my great aunt with that $2,000. There's Joe, uh, Joe Martin from uh, Parsons. His boy Joe taught at Southeast and taught at Weir and taught in Frontenac. He loaned me this and took pictures of it. This is a, was, I don't think it was Joe Martin's. I think it was probably his father's as a member. This is the Scammon Lodge. And this is their symbol, one of their <clears throat> banners they'd wear. And there's mine number 18 where William Wallace died, I think. We're not sure about, really, exactly about that. This is my other great uncle. William Wallace, the one that was crushed in the mines, he was 27 when he died. My grandmother was 13. Uh, later... Uh, I think it's uh, 11 years later, so my, my grandmother would have been 23. He was, uh, Joseph was 34 and died of the flu. I say he died of the flu because of the date that he died and the age. There was no mention of an accident or anything else, and so I believe he died of the flu, although I haven't really confirmed it to, down, to, uh, down to the letter. This is what my dad and mom looked like in Parsons, Kansas, uh, about the time they got married. My dad worked in a shop cutting down 16-inch wheels to smaller wheels. My mom worked at Katie Hospital, which was an epileptic hospital, and it, tra it treated epilepsy like a mental illness then. Mm -hmm. And uh, they met, and uh, they had uh, my oldest sister was born in Parsons, and the rest of us were born in San Diego. There were four of us. My oldest sister, Teddy, was born in 1940 in Parsons. I was born in 1950. That's me in Aww. San Diego. Aren't I cute? <laughs> and here I am again, and here's my, the whole family around a little train set in our driveway in San Diego. This is my dad. He was a union man, and uh, he, he made his chops in the union. And he was the president of Local 506. Uh, it's an aircraft, uh, Ryan Aircraft. He worked, it was an aircraft workers. It was 
Oh, I forgot my letters, but it's uh, uh, like Aircraft and Auto Workers Union in San Diego, and he was president of the union, and this is him overseeing an election. He's a, an election uh, supervisor. And uh, we used to have union meetings at the house, so if I'm a liberal, I come by it honest, you know? <laughs> Why did your family pick up and go to California? 1940, right here. There was nothing going on anywhere. My dad was a, you know, my mom's smart. She graduated from Oswego High School at 12 years old. My, she worked at the, uh, the state capitol uh, as, you know, they send them up there to work as, uh, I don't know, pages or something. She did that. She's smart. My mom was smart. My dad was smart. And here he's working over there cutting down wheels, and she's working at Katie Hospital as a, as a candy striper. They went out there and got jobs in the aircraft industry and did good. Built houses, made money, and worked all through the war. My dad was in an essential industry, so he didn't go to, go to war. He stayed at Ryan Aircraft in San Diego. And this is after he was a union president he jumped the fence and became a, a industrial relations manager for Orion Aircraft. Now, he always said, and it's true, my mom was the ambitious one. And he wouldn't have done any of that. He, he would have worked, he would have done well, but he'd have never really excelled like he did without her ambition. And you see here, he's wearing his Lions pin, and she's being inducted as president of the Lady Lions. So they were, they became big shots. My dad was commissioner of Torrance Airport for a couple years. And uh, they did well. This is a symbol of the United Mine Workers. John Lewis's organization there. I'll call it John's, it might as well have been. He made it. This was the Knights of Labor, which was a, an organization that, uh, there were meetings here in Columbus, there were meetings in Weir, there were meetings all over the Knights of Labor. They were very aggressive in the, you know, looking out for the workman's cause. And uh, they were pretty radical too. But then the United Mine Workers came along. There's John Lewis. He was a miner. There he is. <laughs> People that questioned his chops as a miner, but he was a miner. Yeah. You may not have stayed a, stayed a miner long, but. He was, he was president of UMW from 1920 to 1960, 40 years. Mm. There are people in this room who think he was the best president the union ever had. And there are people here who don't think so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they had, I love these old cartoons that the papers had. Shot an arrow in the air, where it fell, I do not, uh, I know not where. And uh, a plague on both your houses, this is John Lewis, and all in the politics, because he could sit on the wheels of industry. He could stop, he could shut her down, and he did. Here he is. Everybody's out of step but John, and he's going the opposite way, but you see they've got the flags going that way. So they, the papers were mostly anti-union. And this is really sort of against the union, saying that John is going against the interest of America when the flags are all going that way and he's going this way. <coughs> and then pig, 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 high wage trough. Talking about the damage that high wages do to the economy. This is the Labor Day Parade in Weir, Kansas in 1902, I believe. It was quite a thing, you know. It was... I mean, they, the whole town ran on whistles. I think a lot of you know that, but I never do it. The whole town ran on whistles. You never really knew when you got up in the morning if you'd go to work that day because there could be all sorts of things would happen. There were whistles, and you, you told me some of the whistles, didn't you, Larry, what they meant? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> well, there were whistles for, you know, when it was time to start and when it was time to stop, lunch and... But there were whistles for when there was accidents and there was whistles when there was, uh, you know, any kind of problem or whatever. There were whistles and, and every mine had whistles and most of the people lived close enough to the mine they could hear them. And they'd know whether they were working or not that day. 
This is funny here, actually. This says, a, gigant, a gigantic strike imminent. Everybody going out forever. Well, you read the small print. A gigantic stock of clothing to select from, and we will strike the prices down until they are within reach of all. Do not run the imminent risk of waiting too long. <laughs> so they use this, this strike fear, this strike mania that was about the country to uh, sell, you know, to use in advertising. Kansas was not highly populated. It was a new open territory. They only opened the Cherokee Strip here. Cher Cherokee, what was it called? The Neutral Lands. Neutral Lands. They only opened it in 1860. And there were other areas of Kansas that were newly populated. They, businesses, everybody wanted people to move to Kansas. So here were all these opportunities. Come to Kansas. We got work for you. We got land for you. We got, you know, ho free homes, you know. Uh, go to Kansas. All colored people. And now we're getting into the, the blacks that came to Kansas when they advertised in Alabama and Illinois where there were unhappy miners in a town in Illinois, they'd had a big riot and dead people and everything. And they brought them to, they brought people to Kansas to work. And although there was trouble here, it was no panacea, but it didn't ever erupt into huge riots with a lot of death here. Like it did at one that town in, in uh, sorry, I can't give you the name of it in Illinois. But these kind of flyers were all over the country. <clears throat> if you're interested in what happened with the black miners in Weir, or in this southeast Kansas, John Robb is the authoritative voice on that. He's written this flyer here, was written in the early 80s. He wrote a, his thesis at Pittsburgh State in 1965, and it's available at the Axe Library. If you ask for the writings of John Robb at the Pittsburgh State Axe Library, you'll you'll find this. It's also at the Pittsburgh Public Library too. The uh, the thesis or this book. Uh, the book. This book, yeah, and uh, it it really <coughs> quite detailed about where the where blacks came from, what they landed, how they were told they were going one place and they ended up taking them somewhere else. Just and they they just. They'd advertise down there, and they'd get it. They didn't get in a. They didn't get in a Pullman car. They got in a box car, and they. I don't know if they even provided anything for them to eat much. You know. So. This is the colored school. It was called Central School in Weir, and uh, they were segregated. But they desegregated early, way before. Way before Brown versus Board, Weir, and a lot of places in Kansas desegregated before that. This is just a certificate of uh, attendance for Clarence Tyson, a black man who's in his upper 90s now and lives in Las Vegas. And there's just one of the classes, Central School. This is Norma Tyson. And uh, let me put this right. She's Norma Tolson. <laughs> uh, I trust my memory too much and it fails me a lot. Um, this is, she came back here in the 80s and she wrote this book. And if you're interested in black genealogy, that's an that's a informative book that she wrote about. It's more about family life and about activities of daily life in Kansas of, of the African Americans in Weir. And, uh, She's responsible for setting aside the Weir Cemetery. It was there. It was originally believed to be four acres. Well, it was actually called the Co Company Number Six Cemetery. cemetery. That's right. But in the papers, they would say that they were buried in the Black Cemetery, mm -hmm. and uh, or in the Negro Cemetery, a colored cemetery. They would say, colored cemetery. And this is it right here. The green spot right there, this is between Dreyer, uh, which is Northeast 30th, Northeast 20th, Liberty Road on the south, and Highway 103 on the north, and it's almost dead center. Hmm. 
on the section there. And the easiest way to get in is right here. It's owned now by Carl Musa. He's very accommodating, but I wouldn't go in there without asking him. <laughs> so, uh, there's been a lot of talk over the years about setting up. There's no, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. No headstones at all. Mm -hmm. No headstones. And I can remember no as markers. a kid when there used to be headstones there. I remember funeral processions going up there mm -hmm. from the, watching from the Weir High School. So it was in use into the, the 50s for sure. Andersons, I think, is the colored people that own the property right next to them. Yes, Anderson on the east side, on northeast 30th, you come back in from what is Catalpa, right there where Catalpa, if Catalpa went through, it'd go right on out and the Anderson house was there. And they, after they moved, they left there, but it was vandalized so much they finally tore it down. Mm. But it was a nice home. It was a real, really nice home. It was set up the end of a long lane and it was, it was nice. Yeah. This is a sinkhole right there on that same section down towards Liberty Road. Right, at, This would be right on the half mile mark on Liberty Road between 20th and 30th. And that's Liberty where the pickup truck is. And that's a sinkhole there in the field. Just showing what we're dealing with, what's left over around here. This is a map that shows the location of the Stone City Cemetery. This is... Uh, a mile north of Highway 102 on Northwest 40th. This would be East Mineral down here at the bottom at 102, it'd be East Mineral. Then north a mile, and this section right here, this is the cemetery right here. Although, the problem I have with this one here is there's no indication of anybody ever being buried there. We have no obituaries, we have no family Bibles, we have nothing, although I've talked to a number of people. I've talked. Ella says, "Yeah, that was a black cemetery." Mm -hmm. He yeah. says, "Yeah, that was a black cemetery," but there are no records of yeah. it. It's tough. It's tough to. <laughs> I don't know what you do. You know, it's. But it's owned by the state. This is owned by the state of Kansas. I was going to tell you on this here. This section of land was not deeded. It was owned by the farmer that owned it and farmed by the farmer, but after. Uh, Norma Tolson came and wrote this book and she got together with the county commissioners and had that uh, land deeded over and it's in the name of Cherokee Township now. It's outside Weir City Limits so it's in the township and it's in the name of the township. So it's a recognized cemetery now at least and they've quit farming it. So that's the Stone City, City Cemetery up there north of West Mineral of north of East Mineral. That's Liberty Road there. And this is Yale Cemetery. It's this section right up here. Is this the part in Kansas or the part in Missouri? It's in Missouri, and this is the state line right here. This is 270th Street. South 270th is the Missouri-Kansas line. And it's in Missouri, and this is 600th Avenue which is where you go right past Chicken Mary's and Chicken Annie's. When you go by there and then you go right on out, and when you hit the state line, the road curves, and there, and there are headstones there, and there are records of over 200 people buried there, and the county has those records. And I have a list of names. There's another cemetery farther to the west that I found in my job when I worked with a Kansas Department of Health and Environment, the surface mining section, of a colored cemetery. It was a mine maps and stuff. Right in the center of this, there was a small part that said colored cemetery. And Again, I went to, was that in Kansas or Missouri? It was in Kansas. And I went to where it was about, and uh, it, it was a farm field. You'd never know anybody was buried there. Mm -hmm. I imagine with some ground penetrating radar, you might find if there's graves there, but it's marked on that map. And I had it set aside for Norma because she did a lot of work. I helped her a lot with her research. And she, well, she died. She was, you know, she was very active in what she'd done, very outspoken individual, very knowledgeable. But she would have been down there to look that over, I'm sure. Well, there's the 
there's a nice shovel, the 5560 electric shovel, Marion Bucket 18, 24 cubic yards. Give you an idea, 24 cubic yards, pretty big. Brutus is 95, so Brutus is bigger. <laughs> Probably Brutus is bigger than everybody. Um, this is the, I always found this interesting that the uh, main display out in front of the Ch uh, Crawford County Mining Museum is a Cherokee County shovel. <laughs> and it says right on it, Weir, Kansas. Weir City, Kansas. So was Weir called Weir City? It yeah. was called Weir City, although I, it wasn't long after it was formed that it was they quit referring to it officially as Weir City, but there are still people today that call it Weir City. Yeah. And I still do. I, when I write a check for the water, I still write it on Weir City. Weir City. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <coughs> yep. But it wasn't Weir City officially for very long after it was incorporated in, in 1875. It was established in 1872 by the by Mr. Weir, and uh, it actually became a city in 75. This is a Markley shovel. This is the design after uh, that was copied by P&M to build Brutus. The Vsar theory, when that machine was handmade before electricity. Uh, it, when you look at it and you sit there and look at it, how did they drill the holes, holes that big around uh, and put it together, but it was put together with spare parts. And they would dig uh, <clears throat> uh, coal in the summertime and store it, and then they would take a uh, wagon and mules and, and distribute it in town to, to people that work coal. But uh, the stick, that one, is, you see the boom there, but see that stick? You saw Siri come down here and sit on the bank and drawed that up and went back to be uh, back up where, where, where are they from Milwaukee South Milwaukee Wisconsin yeah and um, drawed that stick up and that's why big Brutus has the stick on it as of today and uh, what do you call that stick you had a name for that system it's a Cable crowd retract system. Uh, he uses cable to push the stick in and out. And uh, the article that was printed was in the 1930 Ill Illustrated Mechanics. And uh, we kind of think maybe that's where Busire Siri got the idea to come down and look at it. Because it, it uh, tells about the uh, slip through a sleeve, the stick going through a sleeve. And they might have been curious and come down, looked at it, and took pictures, went back to South Milwaukee. And, the first shovel I know of built with Markley's system was a 1935 950B. And the and one of the major advantages of this slip system, <clears throat> that? one of the major advantages of this slip shovel, slip system, was that if you hit something and this bucket turned, yeah, nothing was turned. hurt, nothing broke. Not, it, it, it used to have two arms that came down, and if you hit something hard and the bucket turned too much, something broke. But if you have this slip system, the bucket might turn a little bit and it'd turn inside that other sleeve and it wouldn't, wouldn't hurt nothing. The cables would just move a little bit and you're still in business. There's going to be an original uh, magazine of that Illustrated Mechanics, 19, July 1930 Illustrated Mechanics. The Markley family found one and they're donating it to Brutus. So it will be on display. You can read the story for yourself and go down there and look at the machine. How many years you've been looking for that magazine, Carl? Uh, <laughs> I started looking when I first found it. I couldn't find any online. I don't know how he finally found it. But, uh, That's amazing. Great. That's great news. So it's going to be on display in the museum and right to the article. And you, can, you can look for yourself. Wow. Okay, great. And these guys, these guys here, moved this thing from where it was to Brutus, and it's sitting right next to Brutus now. It was sitting in dirt about a foot. It had settled down in the dirt about a foot. And there was trees that big around, grew up through the bale of the bucket and all around there. You could, you could hardly see it. And uh, uh, Jerry Hanson, he, he's the man that went in and cleared it all out so we could get it out his back over half a mile back off the road, back in a pasture. 
and we loaded it up on a, a handmade trailer wheels, uh, Tilton's did, and moved it out of there. And this is back before we dried out. <laughs> it was wet. <laughs> we had to pl plate it out in big, big steel plates to get it out of there. We had to build a road to move the road in front of the tracks all the way, and that was for what was carrying this. Mm -hmm. And there's the, the boys there at Big Brutus, coal miners reunion of 2019. All four of these guys are in that picture. Gigi, Larry, Carmen, Jimmy, and Jimmy says he knows every one of them guys. Yep. And there's a few girls in there. And a few girls too, huh? Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. It doesn't like to back up sometimes. Um, quits working for me when I mess with it too much. Come on. When was that picture taken? Uh -huh. When was that picture taken? 2019? Come on. <clears throat> Your fingers get the end of your computer. I think so, yeah. Okay, slow down a little bit. Is that the 950? Not there. What is that? That's a Marion. 55-60. Where's that machine at? I don't know. We had 55-61s down in the meat of that, too. Okay. So we went over to the surface mine division. One of the first things I asked when I started this project was, where are the mines? What mines are where? I want to see a picture of the hall and rooms and see where this all is. Well, we haven't got all that, but we do have a lot. And this is uh, Weir. Let's see here now. This is Weir right here. And uh, I can look in here and find my house right there and see that Keith and Perry was mining right under my house. And uh, Hamilton number one was just north of my house. There's a strip there just north of my house that they didn't mine. And so I've got these maps on display out at the Franklin Museum right now. And if you know where your house is, you can find what company was mining under your house. That was, that was in that deep mine, underground. Underground. This was shaft mining. And that's the, that's the big change that happened that affected the economy around here was the difference between shaft mining and, and strip mining. And I, I don't know, did you hire maybe 10% of the men did strip mining that did shaft mining? I mean, each one of these mines around here had 100, 200, as many as 400 men working shift work in each one of these mines. And there were 40 mines between Scammon and Cherokee and out, you go out east about six miles. In that area around Weir, there were all these 40 different mines, shaft mines, and so you had, you know, who knows how many. That's where the number 10,000 people living in Weir comes from, because that's where all those guys were. And uh, when they moved to, you know, to st uh, strip mining, that's when the numbers went down. That started, that started as early as 1910, but it really took hold by 1925, 30. The jobs just went away. And that's what happened to all the blacks that lived in this area. Although there were lots of blacks living here, when the strip, when the shaft mines went away and there were only a few jobs left, well, I can tell you the blacks didn't get them. The jobs went to the whites. And so the blacks, uh, old, old, uh, George Jackson, he had a job, of course, he had that supermarket, had that market, he made it go. But there just was not as much work for him. And then so they, then this is the time of the Great Migration as well, when everybody was moving away from the country to the city. And so all these guys moved out of the, out of the country into the city, and my folks as well. 1940, they were out of here, had a car, and away they went, and uh, along with everybody else. This is uh, uh, the same kind of map over at Corona and Roseland. And uh, those are on display up there at Franklin if you want to look at them and find your home. And you, know, you can see what the, this is an old Sanborn map of Weir. And it shows that what, what were alleys, what, were, what are alleys now were streets then in Weir. Behind Bath Naylor, that alley north of Simone's, that alley, 
those were streets, but now they're they're alleys, and and they were all numbered. They didn't have as they had a few that had names, but mostly they were numbered streets. Now they mostly have names. There's Mason, Mason's uh, the Troutman Station, the uh, water tower. They used that water tower until it started leaking. You could get a shower under it after a while. <laughs> you go by and it was just constantly a stream coming out of it the last few a couple of years before they got the new tower built. That's a real pretty thing though, that. It's showing a little wear now. This is a recent picture. It's a good looking picture, isn't it? Good looking, good looking deal that. Very nice. Jackson Sanitary Grocery, right Larry? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it says so on the sign. Yeah. <laughs> who, uh, who, who put the new roof on it? Used to get uh, snow Roberta cones. Roberta Uber. Roberta done that? Yep. Of course, he closed. He died in, I think it was 65. Something like that, yeah. And uh, I have his obituary, but... Uh, it was past that. Before I ever came to Weir, my uncles in California told me about it. Mr. Jackson, and he, when you went in, he was Mr. Jackson, sir. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't take no lip, you know. You were, you mind your P's and Q's. You yeah. came in, you got what you wanted, you got out. That's, you know, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't yeah. side talk him at all. And they, and they said it with kindness. They said, they respected the man. They, they didn't, you know, I mean, they didn't say anything bad about him. They just said they, they minded their manners when they were in there. That was with Donnie Scott. We were kids. We went in there and Donnie, he had a quarter, so he, he was going to get some candy. He said, hey, George, I want a nickel's worth of those uh, whatever. And Mr. Jackson looked at him and said, son, when you get older than me, you can call me George. Till that time, you call me Mr. Jackson. <laughs> Too bad we don't have that respect now. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a long ago when you was talking about the cemetery, now out there at Hosey Hill on the east side, uh -huh. there's black people that are buried in there. Yeah, that's a, a lot of them down there. Matter of fact, that's where George is buried. I was going to ask Kathy about that. Uh, just looking at the obituary, I was wondering where he was. Well, I go, seen go this. To the, all the way, when you come up to the Sexton House, go all the way to the east road. Go down maybe two or three hundred feet on the east side. There's his, his graves there. His, he was born in 1865. Yeah, it says so. He was so almost 100 years old. 103. He was 103. It yeah. said in the obituary. Yeah. So he must have died in 68. Yeah, that's about when. Mm -hmm. Here's the brickyard. What's left of it? There's yeah. not even that much here now. <laughs> this is just a pit where they used to throw it. And Carmen said he used to go get. Bricks out of there. You used to be able to go and get fill out of there for not too much. Yeah, they'd throw all their junk or stuff that didn't make it through, broken bricks, whatever, all in there. My chimney in Pittsburgh is made from brick that I got there. Out of the out of the hole, out of the, uh, uh, the brickyard. Yeah, I bought the bricks at the brickyard. Oh, you bought and the bricks. I brick. built, built my chimney for my wood furnace. If you if you wanted the but the off spec bricks, you could take your truck or trailer and park it there. And they would uh, leave the keys in it, and they'd fill it up for you and call you when it was full, okay. just to get it out of there. But they were broken bricks, twisted bricks, whatever, whatever didn't meet the, the specifications. But there were several articles. I, I read a lot of different articles on the brickyard and different, uh, you know, legal descriptions of things that were going on to get the brickyard going. But what I found most interesting was the brickyard was built originally out to the east end of town on Main Street on the north side where that big hole is. Dave Strickland owns it now. And the reason they built the brickyard there was that they had clay and they had coal. And they they fired the brick with the coal that they were digging out of the ground there. And the, uh, well, later, of course, they went to gas. And they moved down there. I guess there was, I don't know if the clay run out over there, but they had the clay down where the brickyard is now, down on the south end of town, uh, south of Catalpa. But I thought that was interesting. The reason they came is because they had the two things they needed to make bricks, energy and clay. This is uh, an explosive storage building. Where was it at originally? 
central line number 39, it would be on the Coal Valley Road back where the Hamilton pits are now. But mm -hmm. That's where that mine was, and that building was moved. Uh, Kukovich, Kukovich has bought that when they closed that mine down, and they hauled it back to Daisy Hill with horses. And uh, they call it a powder house. And it's got a sheet metal, you know, knock down the outside just to kind of stave off the fire. But that's still sitting there. You can see that on Wild Canary up in Leewalk. Yep, uh, yep. What we're looking at now, these last few pictures, this is all stuff that's there now that you can go see. These pictures yep. I took yep. just within the last couple months. So this stuff is here still. The basins, the general store, the brickyard. You used to get to read the this. number 39 in the top, but one of the Kukovich's kids came back and retired there, and he painted it red, so he painted over that 39. Uh, this is a horse pit up on Kirk in Kirkwood Wood on 210. Let's say it's between 5... It'd be in Crawford County. It's in Crawford County between 510 and, between 520 and 530. And this is on the east side. And these are horse pits, uh, uh, Jerry Lomshek told me about it. And these were, this pit was dug with horses and drags. And that's how they originally did, the first mining in this area was strip mining because the coal was so shallow, yeah. Yeah, my, uh, my grandfather Roger and his cousin, John Henry, uh, came here in 72, I think, in the, and they were uh, just at the end of, uh, what, 103 is the road that goes out of uh, Weir. Yeah. The east. They were right at the end of that, just down and, and just across uh, 69 in that area. And they uh, they did all, did all their business with Slip. And, <laughs> and, and what did you say his name was, Rogers? Yeah. Uh, How did you spell that? Uh, without the... D oh, okay. I, my middle name is with a D, and my grandfather is a Roger. My great grandfather is a Roger. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Denham's had a mine, a strip mine there for quite a while after that too. Denham. Yeah. Yep, Denham's Coal Company. Mm -hmm. He 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 did it all. He was a one man operation pretty much. He dug it. He had his little drag line. He'd get the coal. He'd haul it in. He'd run it up there and dump it in your truck and way out. He paid him, but it was. My, my grandparents quit that and went to farming in the local area there. Uh, if you were a miner of a dinky, a small mine you mined yourself, you could either sell it directly to, haul it to people's houses, or they could come and get it from you and sell it to them, or you could sell it to a broker in Weir. And they have businesses that had, uh, you know, that's what they did. They got coal and they sold it to the people around for their houses. And uh, the coal brokers, you know. This is the... Uh, what used to be the depot, train depot in Scammon, this is the building, although it's moved. It's, this building is just south of Josie's. It used to be over by the railroad track on what is Katy Street, which is like if you took 102 through Scammon and all that, or through uh, West Mineral and all that, where it goes east and comes up to Highway 7, east of that is Katy Street. And uh, that was on Katy Street just by the railroad track. One side. That replaced the original depot that was set down close to the tracks, but yeah. that was probably in the 50s or 60s that they did a lot of those. They were more efficient, but they lacked a lot in uh, aesthetics, but the original Scammon Depot, I've seen some pictures of it. It was a nice big station. Yeah, we have a picture of it in the Scammon Do building. you? Uh -huh. Good. Was that a key? Uh, Frisco. Frisco. Mm -hmm. This is the trestles that are left. That's just off Katy Street right up here. Just down south, coming into Scam. This is the trolleys, tre trestles. And the old Lincoln School was not too far from there. Was that where the, new, where the elementary school is now? No, no. At one time they had two schools. The one that is now, that was the old Jackson School. And the one that was over by those culverts was Lincoln School, and it's been gone for a long, long time. And what do you say about this pile? This pile was created by the government out of some yeah, waste, and they a, covered it that's up. That's a reclamation project. What used to be there was a smelter, lead and zinc smelter. This is just off Katy Street. Just if you're standing, look at those. 
So you look at that there, this is that same hill over here at the end of it. Oh. That's uh right. And they took a they dug a big hole and took all the contaminated stuff, put it in, then they took clay and you know, encapsulated it and that there's a just a a silt pond. Eventually it'll fill in, but you know, it's I think Larry Hyatt had a story in the, his paper that said that was going to become a Superfund site. There was a <laughs> well, there is there is talk of a super. Well, Weir is is yeah. going to be the next pitcher, Oklahoma. I think. <laughs> yeah, Weir had a big. They got a mess of where they start clearing out the Weir smelter because that was a city dump for about sixty years after it went out. Of, I remember it up into the fifties. So they've got a big mess back here behind the water plant. Well, I just found out something new about the Gay Parade. Of course, Larry will tell you you could get flying lessons at the Gay Parade. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on any given Friday or Saturday night, you get free flying lessons in the yeah, balcony. If you didn't watch your mouth, and everybody that's been in there knows where the veranda was that went around. You know, it was probably 12 feet off the floor. It was a long way down. <laughs> but he's just told me here lately that. Uh, the man who lives there now has thousands of copies of the little blue books. Yeah, and is, is Bob Black still living there? Yeah, but he's his health is failing, and I think is going to move in with him some of his kids. But he's a uh, he, you know, I think Alzheimer's is working its miracle yeah. on him. But he's uh, he used to come by the museum there, Corona. Yeah, he had a lot of stories about, you know, being a Marine. It's hard to get him to talk about them, but he was in Vietnam. I think that's where a lot of his problems arose. But I think that'd be worth preserving. I don't know how to go about it, but it'd be worth preserving all those blue books he's got if he's got hundreds who, who of thousands. the blue books? The man in the Gay Parita. They're in the Gay Parita. He says they're a, a fire tent. They're tender. That they're gonna, they could go Where up at any time. Uh, Haldeman Julius Haldeman. Haldeman Julius from Haldeman Gerard. Haldeman Julius from Gerard. Now, you know he was that socialist. Printing, printing uh, press in, uh, in uh, Brutus, in the museum, that printing press, uh -huh. that came from Haldeman Julius. Oh, okay. And what was the name of his uh, beyond, re what was it, reason, practical sense, what was it, oh, common he, sense? Common sense. Uh, common sense yeah, was the magazine. He was a socialist, and he talked about, uh, it was very altruistic, things we don't talk about anymore. Yeah, uh, and, and 100 years ago, and I like to read that, you know, and uh, they'll talk about it. They got about the same problems 100 years ago as we got now. <laughs> sure. And they said the same things yeah. about it that they say about it now, you know. Uh, yeah, but he's got cases and cases of those blue books. They're blue books, they're green books, they're red. He gave us, he, I went down, he wanted to give us some for the museum, but. I've got one. I've got a theory of relativity by Einstein. Oh, blue we book. had. Really? He had every, on the blue book? Yeah. Oh, he oh had, my. He, he made copies about every book. I've got one that or two. That's one the I copyrights had run out on, so he didn't have to pay on them. But it was, huh. there was a lot of reading there, and he, he sold them for about a dime a piece, shipped them all over the world. He had a real large printing operation in Girard. I thought his main thing was newspapers, though. Isn't that right? Yeah. Well, he had a newspaper, but he, he made his money with his books. Really? Yeah, his, his uh, call to reason, I think, was yeah. It yeah. was a. Uh, it was pretty socialist at that he, time. Yeah, had a nationwide uh, following. I oh yeah, think. yeah. He was uh, put out papers, loaded them on the train up there, and took them all. Yeah, he the lived place. in Girard. I think he drowned in a swimming pool. That's I right. Think that's the way. He died. Yeah, I think that was in the fifties. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But the, the uh, Gay Parita was built by Pietaro Ferraro, and his wife's name was, or his daughter, it was his daughter? Frank Ferraro's wife's name is Adelia Cresilia. Adelia Cresilia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're both dead now, Frank and her both. Sure. I just saw Dennis the other day. Yeah. Dennis and you ever tell yeah. him? I, he probably knows. I talked to him about it. He corrected me on how I said it, but I, I never say it right. <laughs> I don't expect to, I guess. But uh, Pietaro Ferraro built that while he was running this store. This store, that's what's left of it now. You can go into Corona and see it, it looks just like that. Yeah. Pretty much, it's fallen down. And that's the Corona store. And Larry got the post office out of it for yeah. the Heartland. Joe, Joe, and it was, everything was pretty well in there. And he came down and talked to us and said, I got something that I want to give you people. 
and maybe you'll be able to use it sometime. We haven't got it put together yet, but he had uh, the post office module. It's got all the lock boxes, you know, the mailboxes, mm -hmm. and a little, it was a unit, I think it was probably built in the 50s for, you know, buildings like that, because Joe had the grocery store, he had a filling station, he had the post office, yeah. And when I was in there walking around, I really didn't realize it until later that there's a full cellar or basement underneath it. Oh. And that literally fell in. But yeah. it was quite a place. And here's uh, part of Larry's place down there. This is the Corona Rail Railroad Museum run by the Heart of the Heartlands yep. Railroad Club. And uh, our garden club went there a couple weeks ago and did a tour of it. Wonderful. Wonderful. Life. Uh, what a treasure. What a treasure. Yeah, that's the Boston Depot there. We brought in from Boston, Missouri. The Corona Depot, the one that we have, at one time when it was originally built, looked exactly like that. But in the fall, in November 1941, they tore the build. They, they moved it from down where the, well, well, where the big pipe rolling place is at John Parsons. The depot used to sit there, and there's a water tower down there, but they decided to move it down to the interchange, back to the north, and uh, everybody here I know knows what happened on, you know, <laughs> December 7th, 1941. They embargoed all the materials that, you, you ain't getting wood, you ain't getting nails, you're not getting any of that stuff, build it back. And they said, the farmers have already took half the lumber. So well, I'm well, not mistaken, I believe it. Gigi, didn't you come by there on a troop train when you was going in World War II? Yeah. Because uh, I, I heard Gigi tell that story that when he was on the troop train, he come through Corona and went right by the depot. Yeah. Didn't, I didn't know he was going to do that, or I had my folks would have been there. Yeah. You know, they didn't even know he'd come through there. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to Mrs. Oberzan. She well, was a hundred years old. House. She <laughs> remembered as a girl going there and the troops train stopping, but that was World War One. <laughs> and she said one of the soldiers gave her a piece of hard tack and he told her to keep it because it'll last forever and she said you know he's right <laughs> I've still got it around here somewhere <laughs> Carmen can you tell us about this here and uh, tell us yeah, about that, this uh, slurry pit here okay that is a gob pile from the uh, Pittsburgh Midway uh, cleaning plant at mine 15 in East Mineral and uh, what they would do, they would take the, the big size gob that went through the rotary breakers and everything, and they would line a, a pond with it. And then inside that, they would pump uh, screenings, what, what we call a quarter by zero. It was everything that had went, been screens in the, in the coal plant. And uh, this would have been you know, what went through the quarter by zero stuff. So. And uh, they hold, I knew uh, Eddie Merrill. You remember Eddie, don't you? you she, I remember him. Eddie Merrill yeah. was one of the guys. He had a, what, a ton and a half dump huh. Chevy truck, and, and they had ramps, kind of like to build the pyramids, you know? Oh, yeah. If they got higher, they'd have to go around like that. To, and uh, dump, dump on the outside, the perimeter that made the dam that held the fine stuff, which is on the inside. And a there's a... There, a lot of tons of coal in there, too. Well, that's... Pretty well. I, I I don't know what they'll ever use this land for. It's always contaminated, but you know it's unfortunate. But that's Where what's that? left. And this uh, this is at the corner of uh, uh, Highway 103, 102, and uh, Northwest 40th. It's East Mineral, and it's right across the street, just west of this, was where the old P and M uh, mine was, the main headquarters. I don't know exactly. Yeah. Coal plant, wasn't there a preparation plant there? Yeah, the preparation plant was across the road from this golf pile. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we dug it up in the later years, you yeah. know, uh, the 1250B dug it up. And this is north about a mile and three quarters on the west side of uh, Northwest 40th Street. This is the Fidelity Coal Vault. This is it was inside the office oh, and hey. store. The company store. The company store and the office, and this is still standing. You go look at that today. Until the tornado gets there. It was the site of the second largest, you know, disaster, I guess you could say. There was, what, 18 or 20 people killed in an explosion in that mine? There was 20. I think we have a book on it over there. Yeah. There was a total of 26, I believe. Yeah. Uh, some of them died after the uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, there was 20 in the original report. Mm -hmm. Here's some more. This is just uh, just maybe uh, three quarters of a mile north of 102 on the west side. This is just some of what's left. Looks pretty bad to me. This is uh, Copedale, down south of West Mineral, about seven miles. It's where they took coal and put it in there and baked it and made coke out of it. Yeah. And it was right next to the Katy line. Right on Missouri Pacific and yeah. the Katy. Yeah. The Katy crossed the Missouri Pacific right north of there. Mm -hmm. The coal was good enough in that area that they could make coke out of it, and they shipped a lot of it back to the steel mills to yeah. use there in the coking process. But mm -hmm. I always thought that was uh, for the smelting process for lead and zinc. But no, mm -hmm. no, they, that's a coke oven. They was a big uh, company town right there where that mine's at. And it was, but it didn't last very long. And they call them beehive ovens. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's still these, and there's some others that are in better shape back in Pennsylvania. They did it back there, too. And I don't really know much about how they did it, because they're all, the way you see them now, they're all open. And I don't know if they were open, or if they had a big hole in them, or if they were, if they had it closed some, and they're some broken. Some of the information now. I've read said they were loaded from the top. I don't know that for a fact, but I think I've got some information on that at home that said they were loaded from the top. And there were about a dozen of them out there. And we saw them, they're still there. They're hard to see because they're all overgrown and everything. And that's, it's seven miles south of, I, I should have, uh, I forgot the name of the street. What was that street that went through there? Bell, Bellevue? Bell? Uh, Gravel Road. I think that's, I don't know. Yeah, it's either, either Bellevue or the Star Valley. I don't know. I think I think Bellevue because that that sounds familiar to me. That sounds like what yeah, I was. My my grandfather, great grandfather, Knopfler, owned a piece of that. Right, uh, he may have owned them after they gave it up. I don't know. What yeah, was your grandfather's a... name? Knopfler. Like the guitar player for the uh, for the fine young cannibals? No, he wasn't the fine young cannibal. What was he? <laughs> You're just pulling that out here. Yeah. No, that guy. That guy did the. Oh, that guy sold us a swing. Remember? All right. He Great guitar a, player. He was a Mennonite preacher in his spare time as well. So here's my favorite story is uh, Cora Hubbard. Cora Hubbard uh, was a bank robber. This is her here. She's dressed like a man. This is Tennyson and uh, Shops. They're handcuffed. They, uh, this is Weir's connection to the Dalton gang. I don't think the Daltons were ever in Weir. I don't know, you know what banks they robbed, but... She was young. She was uh, when she was about 15. She hung out with the Dalton boy, Bob Dalton. She, she's kind of hinted she dated him and she danced with him. She was at parties with him, but she didn't ever. She said she never went on raids with any of them. But she was uh, the most. Uh, it, what all the stories say about her that's really interesting is that she, she had ice water in her veins. Nothing bothered her. She never got upset. She was never scared. She was never. When she was when she was when she was arrested, when she was tried, when she was convicted, sent to prison, she always had a smile on her face. She was fine with it all. She enjoyed the notoriety, and she uh, she got together with this man, William Hubbard, her brother, and uh, over in Coffeeville with these two other guys, and they planned a robbery in Pineville, Arkansas. They came back to Weir. This is like eighteen. 96, 1890, no, 1897, trying to figure out, yeah, it was in, and they, they came back to Weir and stayed at her dad's house. He lived in Weir, and she lived in Weir some, but they stayed in Weir for about three days, and then they took off and went down to Pineville and robbed the bank. Uh, let's see here. In our next November issue of our publication, we're putting her story in. Great. I hope you fixed all that mistakes I made. Uh, yeah, it was retyped. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is a picture. This is from the 1897 September 12th edition of the Philadelphia Inquirer. This is the cartoon they drew, drew, drew of her standing on the steps of the bank holding the citizens at bay while they robbed the bank. 
And she didn't go in the bank. She was on the step. That's her. And this is a, a, a cartoon of her shooting back at her pursuers. And uh, uh, they they didn't they they got away. One of the guys got hit and and uh, injured. Tennyson got hurt. He got hit and and uh, she got her sh horse shot out from under her and and she. Uh, uh, they, they made their way back to Weir, but then the, one of the guys ratted them out and they came to Weir and arrested them. And it's just a, a really, the way they wrote this story in the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, bravest and wickedest woman ever known in America, at last behind prison bars. <laughs> and the first line of the story was, uh, the newest of the new women found, something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this was a very loaded term at the time. Women had been fighting for suffrage for 50 years already. And the argument against women's suffrage was this depiction of the new woman. She wouldn't cook, she wouldn't sew, she wouldn't clean. She would vote, she would control everything, she would work and you know, and this would all be terrible. And so, the, the first line of the story, the newest of the new women found, that this is their, what was a, a very loaded term at the time. And it was about, you know, an anti-woman suffrage statement, basically. The new woman, that it was the worst thing you could be was a new woman. <laughs> so. Was there any relation to the Hubbards that's still there? Well, I've been trying to find. They don't claim her yet. I haven't really found her. <laughs> uh, there was a Ms. Lily Hubbard, but she was married to a Hubbard, so it wouldn't have been her. But yeah. uh, I believe they're probably very likely uh, some some Duke connection. Hubbard, uh, uh, yeah. Duke Hubbard. I remember mm -hmm. he had a bunch of kids. Yeah, but Robert and Duke and yeah, uh, and then there was another one. I can't remember what his name was. But uh, I yeah, hear. Robert lived right across the street from me until he died. But that's why I mentioned Sir William Wallace and why nobody paid much attention to him for the first hundred years after he was dead until this book was written about him. And this is the same thing, this article here, for my money, this is what, this article right here, and it's sensationalized and, you know, it, it, but, it, but it's a wonderful story and you'll enjoy the read. <laughs> you'll enjoy the read and the language they used at the time, the way they phrased things and said things at that time. And yeah, it's a wonderful article. Mm -hmm. yeah, we'll so, the that's all I have for tonight. I, I, uh, I've had a great time. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. Very nice. Very nice. I, I have a couple of Very questions. Nice. Sure. Um, when you say the Sir William Wallace, is that Braveheart? Is that yes, a... that's right. Braveheart. Okay. What was his name? Mel, Mel Gibson? Mel, Mel Gibson. <laughs> Mel Gibson. We had a, a program at work, uh, you know, a computer program that they called Wallace a, after the guy. But, um, has anybody ever heard of the title Exoduster? You know, I have heard that word, but I don't um, know. Because it, uh, um, it's a word referring to the blacks who left the South after the Civil War to come to Kansas. Oh, we really? have, Maggie, we have a book on that that was Singleton's on the Exodusters. We have that up there on that shelf up there. Great. <laughs> yeah, the blacks were brought into this area by the coal companies. When they had all the labor unrest and the strikes, they were brought in to break the strikes. Their advertisement was, come to Kansas, the land of milk and honey. They didn't know they were walking into a labor dispute. And a lot of the you know, they kept them in stockades to protect them from the miners because you didn't break the picket line. But once the, most of the miners, once they found out what they were involved with, they were all good union men. They joined the union and... At the same rate as the whites, about 60%. Yep, so it was... It was a while ago, you, you, you showed a picture of a, a woman you said wrote a book, a black woman that wrote a book. Norman Tolson? Norma. Norma Tolson? Yeah. Well, now... What year was that? They was they was about nineteen eighty. Yeah, eighty five, so, eighty two to eighty two. Right there in there. was a group of them come down, and they they had the rumor of uh, of being a, a black burial, 
that was never marked or anything. That's down what they're talking about. Oh, yeah. by scamming. Yeah, yeah, south of scamming. Um, oh. oh, now, Section line there's another rumor of a massacre and a burial out at Liberty and 30th, or was it Liberty and that's 40th? Probably, that's south of scamming. But they did bring the ground radar in, and they didn't find anything out by the out by the substation. They're like a substation. Out. Yeah, supposedly in that. They've got that ground radar, and they're using it now. Uh, I think they were using it in Tulsa to find some of the buried, you know, that were from the Tulsa massacre. Yeah. And uh, there was some talk. Somebody was. I think she was probably, if she'd lived, she was working on getting them to come over here. But it's expensive, and they're busy. Well, um, what do dowsing rods work pretty good? Or? Yeah. Well, ground radar gives you a picture of what's under the ground. I don't know about dowsing rods. They'll tell you something. Yeah, because uh, in uh, Colorado, uh, they were searching for uh, the location of uh, some of the early pioneers from, from uh, out the Big Thompson Canyon uh, area. Mm -hmm. Indian, half Indian or whatever. Carmen, you have some? They had gorilla yeah, I, you know, on this neutral lands, if you want to read a good book, a ki get Killing Crazy Horse by Bill O'Reilly. I mean, it's a page burner, and it tells about the neutral lands and about the fight and Custer's last stand and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you learn a lot of stuff. You know, Custer, Custer going up there it was for gold is what it was for. The United States was wanting the gold out of the Indian Territory. I didn't know that. So maybe a lot, few people did, but. That was the reason he was up there. Was oh, he was up there to get the land so they could get the gold. To get it away from the Indians, you know, and let the uh, the bad lands weren't as bad as they said. You you well, did a thing on on uh, the neutral lands, didn't you? You did a. Mm -hmm. You have something we can read on that. Mm-hmm. Do you want me to get it? No, not right this minute. Just tell them that that they've got it. What what is what do you call it? The we neutral just, lands. The, yeah, we just call it turkey neutral lands. <laughs> You've got to do selling. You've got to sell it, Ella. <laughs> okay, I'm done. I'm wore out. So we're done here. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. You did a good job. Yes. You've done a good job. It's all your fault. <laughs> I was minding my own business. And this so, guy so you talked about coal and you talked about lead and zinc. So were they mining all of those around there? Yes. Well, zinc was uh, being brought here because it was took three tons of coal to smelt one ton of zinc. So the zinc wasn't mined here. It was mined down in Galena and Baxter and down that way. But it was brought up here because it was cheaper to bring the zinc up here oh. than to bring the coal down there. So And the lead, I don't know all about the lead. Well, was it uh, pitcher uh, lead uh, yeah. mining? Mm -hmm. I don't know what went on with that. Yeah, that's known as hard rock mining. It's a completely different way of life. Actually, the coal miners didn't, you know, they didn't, it was like cats and dogs, the lead and zinc. Most of them were referred to as foreigners, you know, the people up in this area because you got a... a Little old, Yeah, I mean, you had the Italians, the French, you know, you had all nationalities coming in here. And the guys down there, they came up from Kentucky and Tennessee, and they, they consider themselves more real Americans. But they was a dividing line of where, I remember my dad saying that you had to slip into Joplin and, uh, you know, get back out because that was all lead and zinc down there. So.